Welcome everyone to the third quarter Zions Bank Economic Update. Uh, we appreciate all of you for attending and hope that all is well with you and your families. My name is Kelly Robertson with the bank's Idaho Corporate Banking Group. On behalf of Zion Corporate Banking Group, we welcome you to this economic presentation and forum today. To create value, Zions Bank's Corporate Banking Group will also be sponsoring other future presentations containing topics that are important and timely for our clients. So please look out for those emails in the future. As we proceed throughout the presentation this morning, please feel free to enter questions into the chat box. We will try to answer those questions during the presentation, but we'll also have a Q&A at the end of Robert's presentation this morning. I would now like to introduce our speaker, Robert Spenlove. Robert is the Senior Vice President and the Senior Economist at Zions Bank. He also serves as the Economic and Public Policy Officer for Zions. In this capacity, he monitors and reports on economic indicators and public policy developments for the bank. Robert's research interests are primarily in the areas of macroeconomics, demographics, financial markets, and public policy. He frequently advises and briefs policymakers, as well as business and civic groups throughout the United States. He tracks key economic indicators for Idaho, and travels the state extensively, speaking to groups in all parts of this great state. Robert is regularly called on to give an expert analysis in the media through print, radio, and television. He is known for his insightful and understandable approach to explaining economic trends. Because of his expertise, Robert's economic perspective is often sought in the Idaho press, and he also contributes regular articles for Idaho publications. Robert received a Master's of Public Administration with an emphasis in economic public policy at the University of Utah, where he currently is an adjunct instructor of public policy. Uh, Robert is married and a father of four children, and he enjoys visiting the Idaho mountains with his families as often as possible. I'd like to now turn the time over to Robert Spenlove. Robert? Thanks so much, Kelly. It's uh, great to be with you today and to, uh, uh, to give this update. Um, it's, um, <clears throat> you know, 2020 has been such an interesting year. I, I don't know if even interesting is a word for it, but uh, we're seeing <clears throat> in, in kind of economics and in a, a number of different areas, uh, we're seeing historic changes uh, and, and impacts. And so that's what I want to kind of spend some time on uh, today, looking at some of those, the nature of <clears throat> the changes that we've seen and what some of those implications are. Uh, it's uh, it, it, in, in some ways, as tough as it's been, it's also uh, kind of exciting to be an economic nerd because uh, I'm thinking, you know, 50 years from now, we'll be writing textbooks about what's, going, what, what's happening uh, to our economy right now. So I just wanna jump in, kind of show what that looks like. And you can see it with the very first slide. <clears throat> this is the, uh, what we call the comes from the monthly jobs report. And on the first Friday of every month, so next Friday, a week from today, uh, the uh, Labor Department releases their uh, jobs report. And uh, what this slide is one that I've used many times, uh, but it looks extremely different from what I've ever used before. Uh, and the reason for that is just the magnitude of what we're experiencing right now. So this is showing month month to month change in jobs at the national level. If you look on the top left, you see that that section of blue that usually fills the entire chart. That is uh, the impact of the Great uh, Recession uh, of uh, 2008 to 2010. And uh, during that period uh, uh, from February of 08 to February of 10, uh, the economy lost 8.7 million jobs. We were losing around 750,000 jobs a month uh, for about six months during that kind of that worst period of the Great Recession. Uh, and uh, there's a reason we call it the Great Recession. It was, you know, bigger and worse than anything that we'd seen in a generation. And it took a long time to recover from that. Well, now look over on the right side of the uh, of the graph. Uh, in between March and April, of this year, we lost 22 million jobs. In fact, most of that occurred in April. You see, uh, April was the big uh, drop. 
In April alone, we lost over 20 million jobs. Uh, more than twice as many jobs were lost in the month of April than we lost in the entire Great Recession. Uh, it, it, it has truly been historic. If you think about why that happened, I mean, this is what, when we talk about a black swan event, this is a black swan event. Uh, it was something that was uh, unexpected, uh, unanticipated, it was dramatic and severe. Um, and so it, it, it's that shock that no one could have uh, prepared for, and it had a, a huge impact on the, na uh, on the nation's economy. Now, uh, coming out of it, again, we've seen historic increases. Uh, between May and September, uh, the economy added 11.4 million jobs. Again, we've never seen that kind of growth uh, in, the, uh, in the US labor market, especially in such a short period of time. So we saw a historic drop in the, uh, in the spring and then a historic increase uh, uh, since then. However, uh, when you look at where we are right now, so you can see that big drop uh, uh, in April of 20 million jobs uh, and, and March uh, relatively smaller. But for all the months that we've come back, we still are down by just under 11 million jobs in the US economy. Uh, and then if you kind of look at the breakout of, of months, you can see that uh, most of that growth occurred in May, and June. It really occurred in June. That was the big uh, comeback month. But since then, if you look at July and August and September, those relative uh, additions of jobs to the U.S. economy are becoming smaller and smaller. So we're coming back, but we're not coming back at the magnitude uh, to be able to gain back uh, those jobs quickly and return back to where we where we were before. So that's something I'm a little concerned about is the ability of the of the economy to come back to uh, uh, the levels we were experiencing before the recession. To show that a different way, uh, this is showing uh, how long it's taken uh, various recessions over the last uh, uh, 50 years to recover, actually over 50 years because we go back to 1953. Um, and you can see that they're, they're all kind of color coded differently. This is a little bit messy, but it's really interesting. Um, so you can see kind of the different shapes or magnitude, or magnitude of, of hits. Um, also, you can see uh, uh, the duration of those kind of recoveries. And generally, it takes about uh, 24 to 36 uh, uh, months to recover from a recession. Um, that's been historic. Now, the reason we call it the Great Re uh, Recession is this is the uh, the kind of the light blue, very long tail is the Great Recession, where it actually took uh, several years, uh, specifically uh, about six years to fully recover uh, from the uh, from the recession. You can also see kind of a, a U-shaped recovery in 1957 and a V-shaped recovery in 1980. So what are we seeing right now? I mean, it just dwarfs anything we've ever seen before. A dramatic drop. Now we're seeing that that uh, that those jobs coming back. <clears throat> so the quite people always ask me, well, you know, what what's going to be the shape of the recovery? You know, V shape, U shape. This uh, this one, when you hear someone talking about the Nike swoosh, this is what we're talking about, where we have the dramatic drop, we have the quick initial recovery, but then we're starting to see slowing. Uh, as the uh, as the growth starts to taper and what we could see is a similar uh, growth path to what we saw coming out of the Great Recession where we slowly come back to where we were before uh, as the uh, economy remains somewhat constrained in its ability uh, to come back again. There's also uh, and I'll talk about this in just a minute. Uh, there is uh, starting to be some talk about a W shaped which would be uh, uh, where we have a, an initial response, uh, initial recovery, but then we start to see more weakness and we slip back into uh, another recession. Uh, we, we're already seeing signs of that in Europe right now uh, and other uh, parts of the world that are seeing uh, new surges of the virus. So where, where have we seen these impacts? Let me see. There we go. Um, so really 
uh, and, and what, uh, what we're looking at here is the impact of jobs. This is specifically uh, looking at the coronavirus uh, uh, impact or specifically the, um, uh, the recession impact of, of the virus. So we're looking from fe February to September of this year. And every single sector uh, during that period is still lower or smaller than it was in February this year. The worst one, of course, is leisure and hospitality, which has just been decimated uh, from the recession. Uh, if you think about, you know, things you used to do, you know, who's gone on a plane lately? Who's gone on? No one's gone on a cruise lately. Um, uh, you know, going to restaurants or going to uh, uh, going to the movies. Uh, the the uh, uh, entertainment sector has, has has really been hurt, and so the leisure and hospitality has been hit the worst. Uh, the next largest is uh, natural resources and mining. And I'll talk about this a little bit in just a minute too. Uh, this is because we're not traveling like we used to. Uh, the uh, uh, demand for oil has dropped. And so that's caused that, that natural resources and mining sector uh, to contract. And then the information sector is also seeing uh, uh, an impact. There, it, it's a relatively smaller industry. And so uh, I'm not as concerned, but the big ones that uh, that we're seeing those impacts are natural resources and mining and leisure and hospitality. Uh, when we look at uh, the 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 number of jobs that have been lost, again, you really see that magnitude. Leisure and hospitality today has 3.8 million fewer people working for the industry uh, than they had in February. So uh, a, a big hit there and big implications for uh, the overall economy. But then uh, again, in relation, uh, the information uh, sector, even though it has a big impact, uh, represents a relatively smaller number of, p of jobs that have been lost uh, over the past several months. Now, in any kind of a, a, a recession or a contraction, there are always areas uh, that are mixed. So there are some, uh, these are subsectors of those industries that are actually thriving. And I don't think you'll be surprised by any of these. Uh, the federal government is thriving up 11.5%. Uh, the result of that is the massive spending from the CARES Act. Uh, the CARES Act was uh, around $3 trillion. Uh, imagine trying to push out $3 trillion of money into the economy. So that's resulted in a, a large uh, expansion of the federal government. Also, uh, uh, kind of warehouse club super centers. So think of Costco and Sam's Club, uh, w w big increases there as well uh, uh, as people have changed their, uh, their purchasing habits. Couriers and messengers, again, kind of that door to door uh, delivery. Uh, the next one, building materials and general merchandise. So you know, as we're as we're all kind of uh, uh, staying home more and going to work less, everyone's thinking about their homes <clears throat> and working on their homes and uh, fixing things. So a lot of demand for that. Uh, and then uh, computer and electronics. Uh, I, I, again, you know, I, we're all doing uh, Zoom meetings. We're all doing uh, 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 online versions of what we used to do, uh, and so uh, the the demand is changing there. So, uh, but there are th that what we are at, what we're seeing, and this is kind of one of our uh, things that I'm watching really closely, is not only the impacts, but how the the nature of what uh, how we live is is changing. And I think uh, while some things may return back to normal, back to how it was before, there are long-term implications of the, the way that we are changing our lives today. Uh, and no one knows exactly how, uh, how the world will look five years from now, but I think it's, it, it will not look like it did a year ago. I think we're, got, we're, we were, our, we're essentially in a period of fundamental change and, uh, and, we, uh, and coming out of this, we'll have a, a very different way of operating. Uh, our unemployment rate is another one of those uh, dramatic changes as a result of the uh, of the recession. So what I'm doing here is I'm going back about 15 years so you can see uh, the Great Recession. Again, 
Great Recession, worse than a generation, our unemployment rate topped out at 10%. And you can see that right here, right around uh, 2010. We, we saw a nice drop coming out of that. We, we'd seen unemployment dropping consistently ever since uh, the, the end of the recession, the Great Recession. Bottoming out right here in February of this year at 3.5%. That was the lowest unemployment rate uh, our nation had seen in 50 years. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the biggest struggle we were having, uh, and you and your own businesses probably know this well, our biggest struggle in February was a labor shortage, finding the people to fill these, uh, these jobs that were in such high demand. So we go from the lowest unemployment rate in a generation, and then the, in a period of two months, we jumped up to 14.7%. Uh, again, that's the highest we've seen since the Great Depression. Uh, the, the, and, and it happened just literally overnight. Now, we've come down from that. We're back down below the level that we saw uh, uh, during the Great Recession. But uh, the unemployment rate in September is still ele elevated nationally at 7.9%, uh, which is uh, consistent with what we're seeing um, with the uh, the job growth at, at the national level or the, the 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 number of jobs that remain unfilled or the excuse me that so that with a higher uh, number of people that have jobs right now. Now one of the unique things about this current economic situation is the the characteristics that story is changing so quickly that what we've had to do, and this was even more true in the spring, is we've had to turn to uh, what we call high frequency economic information to try to tell a better story. So that's what I wanna show you here. These are uh, weekly unemployment insurance claims. So this last one, uh, the unemployment rate comes out monthly. It's part of that jobs report. But on a weekly basis, uh, the, uh, the, the State Department of Labor uh, releases account of how many people have filed for unemployment insurance claims. And so just to kind of break it down a little bit, you'll see there's two lines. Uh, the green line is what we call initial unemployment insurance claims. And the blue one is continued uh, unemployment insurance claims. So when someone loses their job, they go into uh, the, the State Department of Labor and they file an initial claim for unemployment insurance benefit. And then if they remain unemployed past that first week, then they file a continued claim. So you can see kind of the effect of that leading into uh, the, the, the shock. Uh, we had relatively or extremely low initial unemployment insurance claims, uh, but then we saw that spike up uh, and kind of uh, the, the top of that spike nationally was right around the end of March. Uh, as we started to see more and more people losing their, excuse me, uh, yeah, more and more people starting to lose their jobs uh, uh, on the, and filing those initial claims. But then if you look at the continued claims, even though the weekly claims started to come back down into April, those continued claims continued to rise more and more and uh, actually topped out at 25 million people uh, receiving continued unemployment insurance claims. Now, the, the weekly claims have continued to trend down. But remember, the weekly claims, their initial claims, which means it's people that have just started receiving unemployment insurance claims. And even today, right now with the, with the latest data, it's still four times as high as it was before uh, the pandemic hit and the uh, economy fell into recession. So that means four times as many people last week filed for initial claims than, uh, than in uh, January of this year. Now, if we look at the continued claims, they're coming down well too. We're getting better, uh, but we're still not back to that kind of pre-recession uh, uh, level uh, that we saw of, of around uh, 200,000 a week uh, in, the, uh, in the US economy. When we look at uh, uh, Idaho as a, as a comparison, we see a similar trend uh, the, the continued claims are actually a little bit higher, uh, that not higher uh, absolutely, but higher relatively to the nation. We saw that big spike starting on March 14th. 
we really saw the 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 apex at the end of March and then it's come down very quickly. Now this is the continued claims. Uh, we topped out at around 70,000 people uh, in Idaho uh, uh, receiving uh, continued unemployment uh, insurance. But look how quickly that number has dropped down. So, well, and I just want to jump back real quick so you can kind of compare those again. There's the US, so it's coming down, but at kind of a, a, a slow drop. Idaho has seen a very quick and uh, a, a very aggressive drop down from that high level that we saw in uh, April and May. And so that's a good sign for Idaho that while, uh, uh, you know, we, while we still ha have some uh, work to do, the uh, the uh, our local economy is looking really good. When we look at the uh, one of the, the the longer term impacts that I always am watching and always am very concerned about is what we call the long term unemployment. So long term unemployment is defined as people who are on unemployment insurance benefits for well, they may not necessarily be on unemployment insurance benefits, but it's people that are unemployed for over six months. And uh, that's a critical uh, indicator of the economy because once someone passes six months of unemployment, they start to lose the skills, their employment skills, they start to lose their uh, connections, their ability to return back to where they were before. And the higher that long-term unemployment becomes, the harder it becomes for the economy to return back to where it was uh, uh, before uh, a recession hit. So you can kind of see that effect in several of the last few recessions. You see that long-term unemployment go up uh, at, as the uh, economy struggles to return. Again, here's why we call it the Great Recession. That long-term unemployment spiked way up to 7 million people in, uh, in 2010 uh, and then took a while to come back because uh, if you remember back 10 years ago, uh, there, we kind of called it called it a jobless recovery, where even though it was coming back, it still felt like there was a drag on the economy, and it took a long time to kind of bring that back down. So where are we right now? We're just starting to see the early signs uh, of that long-term unemployment moving up. Again, it was it was a, a very low, around a million people uh, in uh, in January of this year, and it's already jumped up to 2.4 million people uh, in September. Now remember, we're seven months into uh, the pandemic and we're seven months into kind of the, the dramatic shock uh, that we first felt in the economy. So we're just starting to see people uh, moving into that long-term um, unemployment characterization, but we're already seeing that num number moving up very quickly. Um, I wouldn't be surprised to see uh, that number if the economy doesn't uh, recover very quickly, that we could see that number potentially surpass what we saw in the, the Great Recession. Um, but th that's one of the numbers that I'm watching really closely to uh, 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 and very concerned about, frankly. So looking at GDP, uh, this is uh, uh, the, the latest numbers for the gross domestic product were released just yesterday. So uh, it, it's a really, interesting and I want to spend a little bit of time on this too because uh, the top line you know when, when you listen to uh, you know the 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 campaigns especially the national campaigns you know you have one side saying oh it's the worst drop in in history and the other side saying it's the biggest increase in history they're both right so uh, but what does it actually mean so in the second quarter uh, on an annualized basis, uh, gross domestic product contracted by 31.4%. That is by far the largest uh, quarterly contraction our country has ever seen. Uh, now, uh, this uh, it's it's certainly possible. I, I should say that our our country has ever seen. I, it's the 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 largest quarterly drop uh, on record, and uh, that's because our records only go back to 1948. Uh, before that, during the Great Depression, there's a chance that it was larger, um, but we didn't have the same kind of data series. Or maybe if you go back to the 1800s, you could see a larger one. But going back to 1948, that's it's what we call post-war. Um, it, it is by far the largest we've seen. The closest you, have, you can get 
is if you go back to 1957, we saw a contraction of about 10 percent. Uh, but this dwarfs that uh, in its magnitude. Now, what did we see yesterday? Uh, came back even stronger, grew 33.1%. Again, that is the largest quarterly increase on record. Uh, and uh, we've, we've never seen, we, we have seen uh, some big jumps uh, in 1978. Uh, we saw about 15% uh, in uh, 1950. Uh, we saw uh, about 15% as well. So we've seen some big, uh, big increases, but nothing like 33.1. So on its face, you may say, OK, we're out. We're out of the hole, right? Because we dropped 31.4 and now we're up 33.1. Um, but th there's a few caveats to this. So number one is uh, GDP. These numbers, the, the way GDP is accounted is on a, uh, a an annualized basis, and so the, essentially this these quarterly changes are assuming that this change were to continue uh, for the next year. Now, if we just if we just look at the actual quarterly change rather than an annualized change, uh, GDP dropped nine percent in the second quarter and then it increased 7.4% in the third quarter. So, uh, and let me show you it a different way. When we look at the absolute value of GDP, so this is the actual value of uh, gross domestic product. Uh, it increased uh, for the last 10 years. It hit a high point in the fourth quarter of 2019 at $19.3 trillion, but then started to fall in the first quarter, and then that drop accelerated in the second quarter. And even with that, so you can see that that drop is, um, you know, is uh, right over here on the right, that kind of uh, downward sloping line. And there's our bottom, and uh, we've come back up again. But even with that, uh, with that 33.1% increase, GDP is still $700 billion below its pre-recession high. Now, if we if we wanted if we were if our goal is to get back to where we were before the recession, GDP uh, uh, is about 3.5% below its uh, fourth quarter uh, high. However, even though it's only 3.5% below the high, it would require a 15.2% annualized growth rate in the quarter to get back to where it was before. So, uh, and let me just put it back in these terms. So that 33.1% for the third quarter would have to be followed by a 15.2% uh, fourth quarter GDP growth to get back to where we were uh, before the recession hit. And I'll just tell you right now, that's not gonna happen. Um, and if, you, uh, if we kind of break down when the actual impacts happened, the biggest impact, if you go back to those uh, those jobs numbers, uh, the GDP impacts were uh, very closely coincide with the job impacts. The biggest job impact was, and, and the biggest economic impact was the drop in April. So that's when we saw the most pain. Our biggest return was in June. So if you think, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the biggest, uh, uh, the, the, the biggest pain was in in the early part of the second quarter and the biggest benefit was near the early part of the third quarter. So what are we seeing now? Uh, we're seeing uh, while it, it appears the economy is still growing, we are seeing slowing. So we uh, especially with the with the pandemic starting to spread uh, more widely, we're going through the you know, kind of the third wave, we're starting to see more shutdowns, we're starting to see more struggles. The uh, the ability of the economy to continue to see the kind of increases that we saw in the third quarter is uh, is not very likely. Uh, most economists uh, agree that it will probably not be until uh, late 2021 or even possibly 2022 until the economy returns back to its uh, pre-crisis levels. If we break down GDP a little bit, uh, so that if you kind of think back to your uh, college econ class, what is GDP? 
you know, it's uh, C plus I plus G plus net exports. So that's consumption, uh, or in other words, uh, a consumer spending um, plus investment, which is business spending, uh, plus G is government spending, and then our net exports. That's the your main components. But uh, what really matters for GDP, there's really only one thing that really matters. And you can see it right here in dark blue on the right is consumer spending. Um, consumer spending dwarfs everything else. It's about two thirds of the entire economy. So if the consumers fear, feel good and they spend, then the economy is okay. If consumers get nervous and pull back, then the economy will uh, uh, will suffer. And you see that in the second quarter of this year, where it was really the impact of consumer spending or consumers uh, no longer spending, pulling back, that really pulled the, the economy into a recession. And then again in the third quarter, as consumers started to spend again, it pulled the economy out of the recession. So let's look at the consumer real quick, kind of breaking that down. How does how does how do consumers feel about the economy right now? Um, you can see that there was so kind of this green line across the middle uh, is the level where people feel like the economy is prosperous. They feel like it's a good time to be spending. It's a good time to be buying things. We saw a big jump uh, in uh, 2016 and 2017. Consumer confidence went up uh, uh, quite a bit and stayed at a very high level for the last three years. For you know, 17, uh, uh, 18, and 19, consumer confidence was hovering between 120 and 140. Great level. But then right there is the shock. Right in the beginning of 2020, consumer confidence uh, got a shock, dropped all the way down to levels we haven't seen since 2014. And while consumers feel a little better than they did earlier this year, uh, we're not back to those levels uh, that, that we saw earlier in the year, and consumers still don't feel like the economy is prosperous. On the other hand, uh, and another one of these crazy indicators that we've never seen before. So this is looking at the uh, personal savings rate uh, of, uh, of uh, people in the economy. And uh, this, this series is going back to 1963. The highest level we'd ever seen was in 1975 when it was uh, about 17%. So where did we get in April? 33.7% of people were, uh, were were saving their money rather than spending it. So rather than putting their money into the economy, they were putting it uh, into their savings accounts. Now it's down from there, but it's down to 14.4%, which is still close to an all time high. So why is this happening? So if you think about it, it was a combination of the uh, uh, of the, the the economy shutting down of the stay at home orders. So there were not opportunities for people to spend. And then also you had the federal government pushing out literally trillions of dollars uh, to households in the country uh, through things like the uh, Paycheck Protection Program, uh, through the direct payments to individuals and households through the enhanced unemployment insurance benefits. They were pushing out money and the, and the goal of that, right? The goal of the $3.2 trillion uh, CARES Act was to inject money into the economy, you know, put money in people's pockets, put money in businesses, so they'll turn around and put that money back into the economy, which will spur economic growth. The struggle is uh, it, it hasn't been as effective as uh, they had hoped because there weren't opportunities to spend and there's still that low consumer confidence. And so people are uh, continue to hold on to a lot of the, the, the money that they've received because of uh, kind of higher levels of uncertainty. Another sign of that uh, is uh, the, the impact on, uh, on oil prices. This is just such an interesting story. If you, you know, if you kind of think about your Econ 101, what are the drivers of the economy? It's supply and demand, right? And so what we're showing here, this is a great example of supply versus demand driven uh, changes in prices. So uh, essentially uh, what we're looking at, so let me just walk through this. The, the green line is uh, oil prices, prices per barrel, while the blue line 
is active U.S. oil rigs. So we're talking about extraction. Uh, now, if we jump back kind of on the left side of the, of the graph, you see oil prices were hovering around $100 a barrel for many years, leading into 2014. And extraction uh, was about, uh, we, we topped off right around here in 2014 of 1,600 active U.S. oil rigs. Um, now, we saw a big uh, shock to the system right around, it, it was literally right around this time in 2014. That was a supply uh, driven shock to the system. Essentially what happened was Saudi Arabia flooded the, the world market with very cheap oil and it drove down uh, those oil prices until they uh, dropped all the way down to about $25 a barrel. And we saw that extraction also drop uh, all the way down uh, to about uh, uh, 350 uh, uh, active U.S. oil rigs. So that was their goal. Their goal was to push people out and make it uh, economically unviable for them to extract. But then uh, oil prices recovered. Uh, we've been uh, in kind of a, a range of 40 to $60 a barrel for the last uh, six years. Uh, and extraction recovered somewhat. You see that it never got back to that level of 1600 where it was uh, in uh, pre-2015, but it got back to around 900. Now, what did we see this year? Here's the exact opposite effect. This is reflecting, rather than a supply shock in 2014 and 2015, this is a demand shock. As none of us, uh, or I should say, as many fewer people uh, uh, are now traveling, there's less demand for oil. You know, we're not going on cruises, we're not going on airplanes, we're not uh, commuting to the extent that we used to. And so that demand for oil dropped very quickly uh, and dropped from around $60 a barrel to, uh, if you remember back in the spring, there were a couple days where the price of oil dropped to negative $40 a barrel. Now imagine, what, what you know, what does that mean? That means that you have to, if you're a, a, an oil producer, you have to pay someone $40 a barrel to take that oil off your hands. I mean, it was, it, it was uh, you know, kind of the, the indication that the markets were breaking down. That only happened for a few days, but we've never seen that before. Now, the prices have come back up again, and we're around $40 a barrel now, but look at that extraction number in blue. Uh, we're, we're now uh, active U.S. oil rigs, uh, uh, today are 193. So again, we were 1600 in 2014. Then we were at around 900 in 2019. We're now at 193. So even though the price is back, uh, extraction has dropped way down, which is having a, a, a sustained and dramatic impact on, um, on oil companies, on the extraction industries, and on many parts of the country as well. So what's the what's the response to this? So this is a, a kind of a really nerdy chart that I love though. Uh, if you think about the Federal Reserve, we always talk about Jerome Powell, but Jerome Powell, while he's the, uh, the chair of the Federal Reserve, there's actually a, a, the Federal Reserve has a board of governors and each one of those governors uh, gets a vote on where the what the Fed will do with interest rates. And so each one of these little dots, if you look at it, each one of those dots represents a vote of one of the governors of the Federal Reserve, uh, Federal Open Market Committee. And so they, when they meet uh, on, a, on a regular basis, they vote on where the rates should be right now. I should say where the federal funds rate will be right now. And then they say, where do we think it should be going ahead? So what we're looking at here is 2020, 2021, 2022, and 2023, and then a longer run uh, indication. The point here is the Federal Reserve intends to keep uh, uh, interest rates very low for an extended period of time. You don't even see, especially 20 and 21, no one thinks that the Fed funds rate should be above zero. And then it's not until 22 that you see one governor thinking they need to start raising rates. In 23, we only have four governors. So I expect that we're going to see very low interest rates continue uh, for an extended period of time, really until we start to see robust economic growth again. 
also comparing. So th this one, if you think of this chart, this slide is taking that chart and applying it uh, over time. So you see that uh, uh, in September of 19, uh, the, the Fed expected had rates much higher and they were expecting to be increasing rates going forward. Uh, in, in December of 19, they started to drop down those expectations a little bit. If you remember a year ago, there was a little bit of weakness and the uh, uh, a, a little bit of uh, uh, uncertainty. Then we get the shock and they've dropped those all the way down uh, uh, to a, a essentially and effectively zero. Now, the Fed says they're going to be back to two and a half percent, but that's so far off. I kind of discount that they're, they're just saying someday we'd like to be back to where we were before. The other thing the Fed has been doing is aggressively uh, buying bonds. We call this the Fed's balance sheet, and uh, it, it's one of the ways that the Fed tries to have a, a, a to influence uh, the, the overall direction of the market. Now, coming into the Great Recession, the Fed had a balance sheet of about eight hundred billion dollars, and then through a series of what they called quantitative easing or bond buying, the Fed got uh, its balance sheet all the way up to about. $4.5 trillion. Now, over the past few years, they've been trying to sell that off until now, uh, and they have completely reversed that. And just in the period of the, of the last couple months, the Fed's balance sheet has jumped up to now it's $7 trillion. You see how slowly they tried to ease up in the quantitative easing before. This time, they just went crazy and bought $3 trillion. Remember, that's consistent with the CARES Act. The CARES Act was $3 trillion. The Fed bought $3 trillion in bonds. <clears throat> now, one of the fears is always that this will result in big inflation, uh, that you know, flooding money in the market uh, will cause inflation. But on the contrary, we are not seeing signs of that. Uh, in fact, the Fed's biggest fear is not high inflation, but, uh, but they're, they're concerned about deflation, which we saw deflation in the Great Recession as housing prices collapsed. We saw deflation again in 2015 as the oil market collapsed, um, and we almost saw it this year. If it had not been for that dramatic infusion uh, from the uh, from Congress and, uh, uh, and the Fed, we would have seen deflation. We, we could have seen uh, certain sectors uh, see prices collapsing. And so that's their biggest uh, uh, goal right now is to, to move up that inflation. We're still below the Fed's target, <clears throat> but uh, we are seeing a little bit of inflation coming back in. And again, most of that is kind of the opposite of what we saw in the Great Recession. Well, it's really what we saw pre-2008, which is housing price appreciation is causing some inflation. One other area I want you to think about, this isn't a problem for NACT right now. I get it. Uh, we, our primary concern right now needs to be recovery and and, uh, and bringing the, the the nation back from the recession. But we, uh, when the time is appropriate, we need to start thinking seriously about our national debt uh, because not only is it uh, 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 has it been historically increasing, but now after this year, for the first time, uh, <clears throat> the national debt is passing the level that we saw uh, in World War II. And then on the right, if you look at that, that yellow line. So this is looking at uh, the August 2019 projection compared to the January 2020 projection compared to September 20, uh, uh, 2020 projection. See that jump in that yellow line? That's because of the CARES Act. So our expectation of the national debt has gone up dramatically. Uh, just in the last few months. Uh, and uh, we don't know how or when uh, it will become a, 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 a real problem, uh, but uh, the, the national debt is something we've got to get serious about and start addressing as soon as we can. One other thing I wanted to touch on real quick at the national level is just kind of looking at uh, <clears throat> we've been looking at some of the implications of different scenarios. And I should say, I. The, these are not uh, analyses that Zions Bank has personally done. This is kind of looking outside, looking at what other groups have done. I just want to stress also that uh, Zions Bank is nonpartisan. Uh, we don't endorse anyone. We don't endorse any parties or platforms or individuals. This is just looking at different scenarios and what they could 
uh, produce uh, uh, in terms of impacts on the economy. So scenario one is looking at what, what what's called a blue sweep. This is where Joe Biden wins the White House, uh, Democrats uh, win the uh, win the Senate. Uh, the the scenarios don't even anticipate uh, uh, any changes in the House. There's not expected to be change in the uh, in the control of the House of Representatives at the national level. The scenario number one is expected to have the highest probability. It's about 60 to 70 percent uh, probability of happening. What would we see there? So again, we've got Biden in the White House and uh, Democrats controlling both houses of, uh, of Congress. Much more and much higher fiscal stimulus. So that <clears throat> if you think back after the CARES Act, the House of Representatives passed a another three, uh, or I think it was like a $3 trillion, what they called the HEROES Act. So following up on the $3 trillion of the CARES Act, they passed three $3 trillion HEROES Act. Uh, the Senate, on the other hand, uh, the, their latest proposal is a $500 billion uh, uh, stimulus. So we've got a big difference between uh, what the Senate is proposing and what uh, the House has proposed, really between what Republicans in the Senate have proposed and Democrats in the House have proposed. So if we've got that blue sweep, we'll see that fiscal stimulus much closer to what the uh, what the House has already proposed, close to that three trillion dollar level. <clears throat> the on the other, now that that will have uh, definitely have a bigger boost to the uh, short term economy. We'll see uh, uh, additional GDP growth. Uh, we'll see additional job growth, and we'll see the unemployment rate coming down. Uh, again, uh, primarily in the, uh, the those are the short term impacts. On the other side. Uh, the um, uh, uh, Mr. Biden has talked about reversing some of the Trump tax cuts. Specifically, he's talked about uh, reversing those uh, those tax cuts for those making uh, over four hundred thousand dollars a year. Now that will have a, uh, a, a that will have a, a kind of a reverse effect of the stimulus. It'll have a more depressing impact on economic growth, uh, but uh, my guess is that if that were to happen, uh, it would not be until uh, after the economy has started to recover, after we're through uh, kind of this uh, this danger period and we know that we're back in a, a, a growth period again. That probably won't happen until about 2021, end of 21 or beginning of 22, <clears throat> which is similarly when uh, most people are expecting uh, GDP to return back to its pre-recession level. Scenario number two is kind of a, a, a split outcome. Uh, Joe Biden wins the White House, Republicans retain the Senate, and then the, the House is uh, Democrat controlled. The probability of this one is about 20 to 25%. What we see here is <clears throat> smaller uh, fiscal stimulus, uh, because essentially the, again, remember the, the Senate's plan has been much slower stimulus. So it would probably be uh, somewhere closer to that um, that 500 billion that the Senate is proposing or has proposed. It, it could be a little bit higher because uh, the the you would have a, a, a Republic uh, or excuse me a, a Democrat Biden uh, working with the House on uh, on getting a larger uh, stimulus. So it might end up the, some of the talk right now is somewhere between 1.5 and two, two trillion dollars. I could see something closer to that. But the other thing we would see, and we've already seen this with President Obama <clears throat> and President Trump, uh, when the, we've, we have increased gridlock in Congress and more difficulty getting uh, laws passed in Congress, we will see uh, kind of that trend of more executive orders and more action through agencies and regulatory change uh, will continue to be used. The other result of that is we'll have greater fiscal uncertainty. Just because when we've got that gridlock uh, with Congress, uh, a lot less gets done and there's a lot, uh, uh, many more questions about kind of where our direction will be. Looking at scenario number three. So this is essentially that President Trump uh, uh, is reelected and stays in office and Republicans retain control of the Senate. 
this has a, about a five to 10 uh, percent probability. So much lower uh, than the other two. Uh, what you would see here <clears throat> would definitely be that fiscal stimulus uh, closer to uh, what we what the, the Senate has proposed at the $500 billion. Um, however, what's really interesting is uh, at least in the last few weeks, we've really seen it's been the House and President Trump that have been pushing for a larger stimulus, and it's been the Senate that's been pushing for the smaller stimulus. So I would guess that if uh, if President Trump wins re-election, he'll continue to push for that larger stimulus. Uh, again, that the House proposal is three trillion. <clears throat> the Trump administration has really been uh, uh, kind of uh, coalescing around a number around two trillion, and I would guess that number would be. Uh, closer to that $2 trillion level rather than the $500 billion. You would also see a much more aggressive push for trade deals, which has been a, a focus of the Trump administration. Uh, they, they've kind of been put on the back burner for the past uh, little while because of the election, but I think those would uh, definitely be uh, have renewed interest, especially with areas like uh, China and other parts of Asia. You would also see uh, another big push for uh, more infrastructure spending which has been uh, another um, <clears throat> push as well. Um, in fact, that uh, in scenario four, we really start to see that. Now this only has like a 5% probability because it's very unlikely that you're gonna see President Trump reelected uh, and not be, uh, not be able to carry over uh, others in his party. But just kind of looking at, kind of rounding out the scenarios, what we see here is um, probably much higher fiscal stimulus, um, maybe even closer to the $3 trillion level, <clears throat> but no, you know, probably north of $2 trillion. And then a real push for uh, the trade deals, but also push for infrastructure spending. That infrastructure spending is actually an area where uh, Donald Trump has broken with uh, many in his party um, and has really been pushing. Uh, uh, his push was for a $1 trillion uh, infrastructure spending deal, and it kind of uh, languished and didn't happen. But I, uh, you could see a, a return to that push uh, if uh, if uh, the president were uh, President Trump Trump were reelected. Okay, kind of looking locally. Um, so what we're seeing is Idaho continues to be uh, doing surprisingly and uh, uh, surprisingly well, especially given the the, the national uh, changes that, that we're seeing. So this is going back a little while. The, one of the struggles with population data is it's always, uh, you know, if you kind of think of real-time economics and kind of the lagged, population is always very lagged. Um, and so, but what we know is that we have a long-term trend of very strong population growth. How does that population grow? Overwhelmingly through migration. <clears throat> we've, um, we've seen a, an acceleration in our migration or people moving into the state over many years. Um, and even though we don't have the hard data, um, we are. See, I, I will guess that when we see the data for this year of what's happening right now, we're going to see a, a, an even higher uh, a migra in migration from many parts of the country, uh, but specifically from the coast. Uh, we're seeing a lot of a lot of people moving into the state, uh, uh, looking for a better quality of life, looking to kind of get out of. Uh, big cities and 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 move to areas where uh, there's uh, more open space and more you know uh, breathable air, um, and and you can really see that uh, kind of our hot areas uh, again. This is really remarkable. Uh, Ada grew 2.7 uh, percent. Now it, it's it's very rare for uh, kind of the the areas where the population is concentrated to also see the biggest growth. <clears throat> it's usually, and we can kind of see that with uh, with Canyon and Gem grew a little bit higher because those are uh, gr uh, areas that have more potential for growth, or you know areas like Bonneville and Teton, or or the uh, uh, the northern part of the state. But for Ada to see 2.7 percent uh, growth, which is above the state average, is is really remarkable, and it just shows how strong uh, the the Boise area is doing. When we look at uh, job growth, well, <clears throat> I should say job loss. Um, e every state in the country has lost jobs over the last year. However, 
Idaho's job loss is the lowest in the country. And, you know, uh, it, it, what's good is, you know, it's consistent with what we're seeing kind of in our region. Uh, you know, Idaho, Utah, Arizona uh, the, uh, are, are all seeing uh, relatively uh, uh, low job losses. Um, but then, you know, look at the differences, though. Look at Nevada, negative, uh, down 9%. California, down 85 New York, down 1102 And then Hawaii, 18.4% job loss in the last year. Um, so there's some uh, uh, dramatic differences uh, between what we are seeing and what some of our neighbors are seeing um, in terms of uh, job losses. And you, uh, to put that in perspective, it, you remember this from the, the national level, <clears throat> Idaho lost 84,000 jobs uh, in the spring. Most of those, almost 80,000 of those were in April. Uh, however, uh, we've been bringing those jobs back uh, uh, almost every month since then. What's one anomaly, and I'm going to talk about this in just a minute. We did lose about a, a thousand jobs in September, um, but we've seen some big increases, and now we're just thirteen thousand. Just well, I guess just under fourteen thousand from being back to where we were uh, before the Great Recession. Um, you know, every state is jealous of the kind of uh, recovery that Idaho is seeing right now. When we look at those sectors again, uh, the big drop is that uh, information sector uh, dropping 14.4%. Um, by the way, I just want to point out uh, there's there's often a, a misunderstanding about the information sector. People think that it's high tech, um, but it's not. Uh, the information sector is uh, is newspaper production, magazine production. It's, uh, uh, um, you know, kind of your uh, media and then internet service providers. And so it's a really small sector um, relative to the, the rest of the economy. And so that's why it tends to fluctuate a lot. And if you think about an area that's suffering, it is, um, you know, kind of those uh, those uh, traditional media uh, uh, areas. And so that's why we kind of see that, that big drop. Uh, but then, um, you know, uh, surprisingly strong growth in uh, natural resources compared, compared to the nation. Um, and then financial activity, a lot of that is because the way that uh, the, the federal money is being distributed is uh, uh, through the uh, financial system. When we look at the number of jobs that have uh, changed, trade, transportation, and utilities uh, growing 4,300. Manufacturing, I mean, that's great. Na nationwide manufacturing is really struggling, but we're seeing growth there. Construction, of course, is really strong. <clears throat> but then you see leisure and hospitality uh, uh, is, is probably the, it would not probably, is the biggest loser in absolute terms, uh, followed by uh, education and healthcare. That's mostly uh, education. Um, uh, he healthcare, of course, is is uh, uh, straining uh, because of the, the demands right now. Uh, what's interesting here is if you think about that, uh, and, and you have to think about the differences in the time periods. Um, so the, that last graph that I showed you was a population growth. This is showing the employment growth. Uh, while uh, the, 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 the state is very close, you see the ADA is still just a little bit um, below, is actually consistent with the state uh, contraction rate of about 0.5%. Uh, I, would, I wouldn't be surprised if in, in the next month or two we'd see that uh, go back positive again. But then um, uh, kind of a what we see kind of a mixed bag of some, you know, really high growth uh, in, in parts of the state and then continued pain in others. Uh, Bannock still down 3.6%, for instance. Unemployment rate. This was one that I was that at the top level, I was a little surprised about. So last month, Idaho had the third lowest unemployment rate in the country. This month it slipped to the 16th lowest and it actually went up <clears throat> to 6.1%. And so, uh, you know, you you might ask, you know, ask the question, well, if, if we're doing so well, why is the unemployment rate going up and why did our ranking drop so dramatically? Well, let me show you kind of why that might be happening. This is, this is one of the kind of the really interesting things as an economist that I'm watching. Um, so you can see the big spike uh, in, in, in the spring, you know, topping off almost 12%. We dropped down 
uh, to uh, about 4%. Now we're at 6.1. But here's the next one. This is what we call labor force participation. So what we're saying is of the entire population that's working age, uh, uh, 18 to 64, how many of the, the, those people are actually working or looking for a job? That's your labor force participation. And look at the nation. Um, the, both Idaho and the nation have been dropping uh, uh, since the Great Recession. Um, but look right here with a shock. The nation's drops dramatically labor force participation because people gave up uh, on the labor force and just walked away. Now it's coming back, but it's still much lower than it was pre-recession. However, look at Idaho. Idaho, there's the shock dropping down a little bit as well, but now the recovery has been even stronger than the shock. So Idaho's labor force participation is now the highest it's been in 10 years. So what that means is that we've got more and more people coming off the sidelines and coming back into the labor market and looking for jobs. Now, one of the results of that is you see unemployment jump because they, they they're looking for a job but they don't have it yet so they're unemployed so so it actually might be a good indication to see that jump in unemployment because labor force participation in idaho has jumped up so dramatically um, uh, and it's very different than what we're seeing uh, nationally people are hearing the story of how well things are doing in idaho and they're responding uh, by you know by moving in greater numbers and uh, and looking for jobs in the uh, in the Idaho economy. When we look at unemployment rates, uh, I, I, we we really have been living through uh, a black swan event uh, over the you know really started in in March and April, but uh, the uncertainty has continued through that out this entire year. No one knows for sure exactly you know what's going to come next will we have another uh, recession will we have uh, a larger resurgence of the of, of the virus will uh, congress uh, you know be able to uh, uh, pass another uh, act but um what what i am expecting is that we will continue to see kind of that constrained growth we've still got uh, a lot of uh, ground to cover on uh, jobs recovery nationally um, on economic recovery nationally. Those sectors that have been impacted by the pandemic will continue uh, to struggle. Um, and that's why it is really important as while, while we do need to be concerned in the long term about national debt, our primary concern right now needs to be helping those industries, those businesses and those individuals that are struggling right now. And I wanna stress, remember, our economy was really strong going into the recession, going into the pandemic. And those businesses that are suffering right now are suffering not because of anything they did wrong. They're suffering because people can't travel. They're suffering because people can't go to restaurants like they used to. People aren't working in their offices like they used to, so they're not going to the downtown restaurant like they used to. Um, and so it's, a, it's essential that we have that kind of federal and state uh, support. But um, ultimately, the economy will not be able to return to back to where it was before until we, uh, until nationally and even worldwide, we have the ability to treat the virus, uh, to uh, to have an effective uh, uh, way to move forward, so we can improve that overall consumer confidence, get people feeling better, and get people back to where uh, they were before. Uh, however, last point, um, Idaho, you know, we're we're really lucky. Uh, to be in an area like Idaho, where uh, the, as tough as things are in other parts of the country, uh, our biggest struggle right now is dealing with all the new people moving in um, because the economy is so strong, quality of life is so good that it's, uh, uh, we're, we're, the economy is attracting a lot of people and Idaho, Idaho continues to be uh, the, the shining star in our country. So thanks for, so much for having me.